We are Leo, the only treatment decision support AI platform used by cancer patients. We're here to help you, help you to truly understand patients, learn what they care about, be where they need you to be, become patient first so you can reach more people and in turn save more lives. For too long, there have been too many unknowns, too many question marks. It's time to close the gap, bring pharma closer to patients and really get to work to solve cancer. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Hi. My name is Anthony Galata, head of sales here at Leo Health. Uh, really looking forward to the uh, to the webinar today. Hi, Vital. Hi, everyone. My name is Avital Gaziel. I'm co-founder and um, uh, chief science officer at uh, Lille. And I'm very uh, excited to be here today with you, talking okay. about the use of predictive AI to maximize patient recruitment. Anthony. Amazing. Yes. Thanks, Avital. Um, I'm just going to make sure you can see my screen. Are you able to see my uh, slides? Oh, there we go. Yes. Perfect. Um, so figured we'd run through the, the framework of the uh, the webinar today. Really, again, thank you for, for carving some time out of your busy schedules to be with us. Um, we just did some brief introductions. Um, figured I'd run through an overview of Leo Health then walk you through the uh, demo of the predictive patient journey. It's a new capability and, and functionality that we're offering to our biopharma sponsors. Walk you through then, have Avital walk you through the clinical methodology that goes behind that, and then open it up to uh, Q and A at the end. Um, so I'm gonna dive in from there. So we really started to see a shift of, of patients taking more ownership over their cancer journeys prior to COVID. All the pandemic did was greatly accelerate this shift we started seeing our subscription skyrocket during uh, the pandemic and then post COVID as well. They've had they've held steady ever since. Um, similarly, our sponsors have seen um, uh, the same trends in terms of direct to patient website traffic up, up nearly 60% in some cases. Um, this really re reconfirms that the days of just solely relying on an EMR or EHR system or stagnant uh, diagnostic list company uh, uh, company lists are long gone. You have to deploy a direct to patient go to market strategy, which is exactly what we do in the market. Um, so what we've done uh, over the past uh, few years here at Leo is we've built and established the largest and most diverse uh, actively seeking uh, community of patient uh, of cancer patients. So we've recently surpassed the 130,000 mark. We're growing at a rate of around 4,000 new signups per month. Um, a big value add that we provide to our sponsors and our partners um, is increased uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and ensuring real world representation. So um, you can see um, just over a third of the, uh, the uh, community represents minority groups and about 75% actually reside in the community setting um, outside of your major metro cities. So how do we do this? So we have developed an AI powered solution that has two core components. The first services, the patient, their physician and our caretaker. The second services, the, the sponsor themselves. So from a patient perspective, they are, they, they come to Leo.health where they're presented with and they complete a short dynamic questionnaire. Dynamic meaning that the patient input is actually what determines the flow of the questions. So it's super unique and individual to that individual cancer journey. On the back end, we have a patented unsupervised NLP or natural language processor that combs through clinicaltrials.gov. It extracts the actively recruiting oncology studies listed there and then creates a list of viable trial options within our system based upon comparisons between the medical profile of the patient and the IE criteria of those studies. Uh, we're all well aware that there are a ton of enrollment barriers embedded into CT.gov, specific to medical language and, and technical terminology. 
So a part of our uh, patented algorithm is it actually curates the protocol descriptions into a more patient friendly language, removing those set barriers. Um, what we learned early on is if you truly want to drive a patient through an enrollment decision, it's not enough to just provide them with a user friendly software and say best of luck. You have to provide them with the, the knowledge, the support, the education to feel validated through that decision. So we have a, a clinical support staff made of uh, PhDs, cancer researchers, social workers, and nurses. They're put in place to virtually hold the hand of these patients from the moment they create a profile with us through consenting with, uh, with a sponsor. Um, if you think about what we're doing, we're doing all the pre-screening for the, for the sponsor. Um, we're collecting four main pillars of data. So uh, demographics, disease characteristics, treatment history and outcomes, and then overall health of the patient. We're then um, de-identifying these, these data sets and translating them back to you or back to a sponsor um, in what we call the patient match optimizer. So here's where you're able to really see where, how many uh, patients have matched your trial, where they're located, a breakdown by demographics, uh, biomarkers, uh, anything that's really, really important from a, from a clinical perspective. Um, we'll take it a step further, however. So we don't only want to show you the, you know, successfully consented patients that we refer to your site, um, but we also want to show you where and why are eligible patients falling out of the pre-screening funnel. Was it due to the side effects of the drug being administered? Was it due to the uh, site location, number of site visits required? Are there uh, uh, treating physicians consistently recommending standard of, standard of care or a competing trial? If so, why? We try to provide the sponsors with as much patient preference data as possible to streamline uh, current and future studies. Um, quick, uh, I want to touch upon quickly in terms of our marketing strategy before we get into the actual demo. Um, so first off, I don't want you all to think of us as your traditional top of funnel uh, digital or ad vendor. None of the campaigns we run are sponsor or study specific whatsoever. This enables us to do two things. First, um, we scale nicely because we don't require IRB approval on those campaigns. And second, and more importantly, it positions Leo as a true marketplace. So patients can come to see all viable trial options, not just those that we're doing business with. But with that being said, these are our four leading patient acquisition channels. By far, number one, uh, social media with inside social Facebook groups. Um, second leading channel is uh, partnerships with patient advocacy groups. Many of these organizations are embedding our pre-screener into their websites so patients can pre-screen through these trusted networks. Um, third is uh, our partnerships with smaller uh, physicians and community-based uh, oncologists. Um, some are, you know, receive iPads from us and they're, and they're able to uh, pre-screen uh, in, in the waiting rooms ahead of their appointments. Lastly, um, educational content, you know, e-booklets, uh, best practices, things like that. Um, so again, we recently surpassed the 100,000 uh, cancer patient mark, and we're growing at a clip of around 4,000 new signups per month. Now, without further ado, I wanna hop into the system to walk you through some of the capability from, uh, from an AI perspective and, the, and really highlight the predictive patient journey, which we're really excited about. So let me share this. Avital, can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this is what we call our uh, patient match optimizer. These are the de-identified and aggregate level data sets that we provide back to our biopharma uh, partners. Um, the, 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 uh, our stakeholders are credentialed and you have access to, to, this, uh, to this platform where the data sets are updated on a, on a weekly basis. But this, the purpose of this is really for you to track uh, the, the progress of, of the program. So here you can see at a program level, so let's just say there's five studies or 10 studies that roll up to this program and you can define program by indication or, or a therapy that's being administered, things like that. Um, but this is the aggregate across, let's say, five studies. On the right, on the top right-hand corner, you can always drill down to the specific study-level data as well. But you can track how many patients were matched, how many of those matches were minority patients, how many were referred, 
and then ultimately consented. You're able to track, you know, top performing um, studies, top performing sites, um, any any time there was a site related uh, escalation that was needed. You can track the referrals that were made. Uh, demographics, ensuring real world representation is one of the biggest uh, reasons why sponsors actually come to Leal. Um, we are, they come to us in kind of two lenses. So the first is to gain access and exposure to our highly diverse uh, community makeup. In addition, they're able to leverage our AI to identify and eliminate unconscious biases embedded into trial design or operational setup. And then in the platform, you can always see throughout each one of these tabs, um, there's a there's some type of uh, a demographic or DEI component. So you can track how your study is um, uh, track track your your study demographics to like the target goal of uh, the percent of of enrollments that you need to be at. You can always see a breakdown of location of these patients coupled with uh, tr uh, the travel preferences beneath that. So we can help support site selection. Always biomarkers and lines of treatment of the patients that are matching to your trials. Again, not only are we gonna to provide to you data around the patients that are successfully consenting, but those that are um, falling out of the pre-screening funnel. So what were those specific patient barriers? And then we will provide uh, best practices and mitigation strategies to, uh, to deploy to ensure that we are combating those. Um, you're able to see the voice of the patient, newer newer uh, capability. So patient feedback and focus groups, which is a big uh, a big focus area in uh, in the industry, especially from a CRO perspective. You can track your uh, site performance by region, but then also down to the specific site level beneath that. Marketing ROI. So this is a this is a, a game changing uh, capability that we just rolled out, and it really does speak to the to the uh, patient journey. So to date, sponsors typically are, are accustomed to tracking um, the, the, the success of their digital marketing campaigns by website views, clicks and downloads. But what, what actually happens after that? So we've created a nice uh, solution where we're able to source track the entire, for the first time ever, the entire patient journey from those top of funnel digital marketing ad, uh, ads being ran whether that's in-house at a, at a sponsor or it's outsourced via a third party, you're able to see that top of funnel metrics. So uh, views, clicks, questionnaire started. But then from there, we're able to see of those patients that are coming to your website, how many were actually relevant and matched patients, how many were ref uh, referred and then ultimately consented. You can see the utility here really focuses on cost savings and increasing efficiencies. So for example, let's say I'm a sponsor and I'm running um, this Facebook ad and over the last 12 months, it's consent, it's uh, yielded zero consented patients, as opposed to this fourth ad being ran in Facebook, it's yielded four consented patients. Maybe it makes sense to reallocate some or all of that budget to um, different ads or, or sources being ran. So now into the uh, to the uh, predictive patient journey. So we're really excited about this. So one of the biggest value adds that we provide to uh, biopharma partners is the one to one relationship that we build with patients. So our team of highly credentialed medical professionals are with patients throughout their entire disease progression. So as they come to Leo, newly diagnosed, treatment naive, uh, receiving standard of care and then progressing onward. We've now been able to productize this relationship in what we call the predictive patient journey. So sponsors will see patients who aren't eligible to enroll in your trial today, but based upon disease progression may become eligible down the line. Our algorithm defines custom groups or cohorts of patients of high potential based on the sponsor's IE criteria. Once these patient cohorts are defined, we immediately reach out to these patients with educational content in order to understand their viable treatment options uh, if and when their disease ultimately progresses. Sponsors then have the, the visibility, as you see on your screen here, into your program's predictive patient journey, um, where the, we're, and again, we're with these patients throughout their entire 
uh, journey. Um, and then you can source track the conversion of these patients. So those that were actually consented versus those that, that weren't where they fell out of the funnel and why. Um, but this really speaks to the long-term uh, uh, partnership that we view um, and we and how we're supporting other sponsors uh, in, in some of uh, program level discussions and also study level uh, support. That's what I wanted to run through. And then I'm gonna pop back over to, oh, perfect. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Avita. Great, Anthony, you can run the slides on your computer, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So uh, as Anthony said, I'd like to spend the next couple of slides looking into a clinical program, clinical parameters and considerations for uh, our partners at the program level partnerships. So here on this slide, uh, you can see an example of uh, a non-small cell clinical trial pipeline of one of one company. So you see five studies here. Um, and you can appreciate some main clinical criteria su such as disease status, clinical stage, whether the trial requires a certain mutation and uh, treatment history. So you see here uh, specified, so it's easier for you to uh, follow. So on the next slide, <laughs> great, thank you, Anthony. Uh, you can now see how this looks like in terms of, um, of a journey of a patient as a predictive patient journey and how these, uh, these uh, uh, studies are actually aligned throughout the patient journey within the program. So this is one example of how we analyze your trials in the context of the patient journey. Um, and, you know, we can do it differently. It can rely on a, a journey. It can look at treatment history. We can tailor a plan that fits your needs uh, and maximizes your impact based on the trials that you have in your program. Uh, okay, so if we look now specifically on uh, this example, so what do we have here? We uh, have some trials for uh, that require a mutation. You'll see them on the left-hand side of, of the screen. Uh, and then a couple of trials that are for locally advanced or metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. And um, on the top and across the x-axis, you see the patient journey for both uh, mutation positive non-small cell lung, lung cancer. And, uh, and then uh, on the right, you'll see the ones that are without the mutation. Um, then you can see the trust spread out throughout the, the patient journey. So you see study one, study two, study three, four, uh, and uh, five. So they are aligned ac according to the patient journey in this example. Um, so for example, if you look at study one here, um, it's for non-small cell lung cancer patients that harbor the, the mutation and have not received any treatment or undergo any surgery yet. So on the y-axis, if you look, all boxes that overlap represent patient groups with a similar clinical profile, okay? So um, you can see that, you know, for example, PP, PPJ1, PPJ1, and study one, all of them represent the same patient profile. On the y-axis, uh, um, yeah, and every color represents patient groups that are linked to the same trial. So you see the matched patients, and then earlier in the journey, the PPJ patient groups that may potentially be a match to the trial in the future. So as Anthony said, we are with the patients across all stages of the journey, and we're creating a very strong trust relationship with them. At any point of the journey, the patient is exposed and gets educated not only on the matched options that are relevant for them now, but also potential future options that may become relevant down the road. So we are, in a way, significantly, significantly expanding the window of opportunity in which the patient can get educated uh, about trials across, the, across their journey. And we are doing it way more robustly. So... Um, what kind of education uh, do we provide throughout this time? What type of communication we, we provide to these patients? It really depends on, on the patient profile and where they are in their journey. So for example, 
one thing that we do with pa patients that are more earlier in their journey, we're going to spend more time educating them about clinical trials in general and their benefits. Okay, so everyone is going to get educated about it. So when it's time for them to join a trial, they're already, they've already experienced some of the education and they're already ripe to make a decision about joining a trial. And this, from our experience, increases significantly the chances that they do join a trial. So the window of opportunity to impact the patient decision is getting way larger because we are now actually looking at them throughout the journey instead of looking at them only in the small window of opportunity where they are a match to your trial. Uh, other things that we uh, communicate and educate patients about, uh, for example, specific treatments or specific mechanism of, mechanism of actions that are important for them to know. For example, if a patient has a certain mutation, we will talk about targeted therapies that are related to these mutations and how important they are and why a patient should know about these options on top of the, let's say, more traditional options that are currently in the standard of care. For example, specific mechanism of actions that are a little bit harder to understand or grasp, like antibody drug conjugates or CAR-T technologies or bites. Okay, all of these things that are extremely exciting that are happening in clinical development right now, but for the average patient sounds like Chinese, and we spend a lot of time pre-educating them. So when the time comes and they are a match to the trial, they're going to be like, oh, I know this technology. This is great. I want to hear more about it. We increase the chances of the patients being interested in applying to the trial. Uh, specific trials that may be relevant for them. That's a pretty obvious one, right? So we always educate patients about the, their future options, the what if, okay? What is your next step? We are now their partner throughout their journey and we're planning together how we are going to uh, address uh, the treatment options throughout the journey. Um, so within the program, every single touch point with a patient includes exploration of not only the trial uh, that is a match now, so for example, if you, we go to study, to study one again, we're going to talk about study one. And this is something that is pretty uh, common in the industry, right? You're going to have someone talk to a patient about a trial that they are matched to right now. What's new about it, that we are also going to talk about other trials and treatment approaches that may be or are available for exploration for the future. So we're going to talk about study two and we're gonna talk about study three because all of them may be relevant for the patient in the future. So uh, let's look again at the example. As part of the program, we map this trial into the patient journey and identify uh, the opportunities in education. So um, uh, this is very uh, similar, as I said, to stuff that is being done right now by some companies, but at the same time, Lily is also uh, starts talking and educating the patient about, about future trials. So we are going to talk about the near future, the nearest future, and the nearer future, right? So we're going to talk about the nearest. Uh, if we look at the an, an example here, uh, let's say now that we have a patient with a mutation and the patient got matched, they are newly diagnosed, they have early disease, so they got matched to study one. We're going to talk to them about study one, but we're also going to talk to them about what happens after they progress and now they become advanced metastatic disease. And then they're going to be a match to study two. So we're going to start educating, communicating about this. And then we're also going to talk about what happens when the, you know, when they run out of targeted therapies against their mutation, right? And that's also referring to uh, more uh, trials that are in within, let's say, a year or a 18 months ahead in the future. So that's more or less the, the, the time frame that we're taking for, uh, for uh, future education. Um, so they're ready. They know what's coming. They know about their options. Uh, and due to that, we are uh, increasing the chances of them actually being interested in hearing more about your trials in your program down the road and not just 
the ones that are a match to their profile right now. Um, this brings, of course, you know, down, you know, also we understand and we know from our patients that the more they know they have, the better the conversations they have with their oncologists, the conversations are meaningful and decisions are being made uh, more easily. And when time comes, they update their profile and they get matched to the next trial in your program. And then uh, they're... Um, um, more open to hear about it and to get referred to it. I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Avital. Uh, super fascinating. Uh, and I, I can tell you all that there is a tangible shift in terms of the, sp the conversations that we're having with sponsors um, from a study to a program level. And that's the exact reason why there's so many more benefits when engaging with Leal uh, at a program versus a study level. Um, the 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 analysis that Avital just walked you through is 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 a perfect example. But in addition to that, um, the the when we engage with sponsors at a program level, it's it really really improving the patient uh, experience, positioning sponsors as more of a patient centric organization, um, and ensures no patients are falling through the cracks. Like I said, we're starting to see those patients really take ownership over their journeys. They're coming to your websites. They're coming to sponsor websites, landing pages. We want to make sure we're capturing them and, and providing them with the best experience that uh, that, that we possibly can. Um, I'm going to pause here to see, first off, if there's any interest in um, having a complementary uh, analysis of the pro of your pr uh, predictive patient journey um, from, from Avital and her team, please reach out to, uh, to sales at leo.health. Uh, we'd love to walk you through um, an analysis and, and see how we can't uh, collaborate together uh, moving forward. Um, and then I'm going to pause here to see if there's any questions or comments from uh, any of uh, the attendees. If not, um, again, you know where to you, you reach out to sales at leo.health with questions, comments. It doesn't necessarily just have to be the request. Uh, but if you are interested in uh, in, in leveraging the uh, the analysis, please, uh, please don't don't hesitate to reach out. Um, uh, Anthony, actually, yeah. there are there is one question here that is yeah. being asked. Um, so the question is, what mechanisms do you use to communicate with patients? Is it online? or is it there a level of uh, counseling? Okay, so this is one question that we have from the audience. So- You wanna feel yeah. that one? <laughs> <laughs> so through our digital interface and with sponsors uh, we have, and you can go back to that slide, this awesome slide where you're showing that we actually do have a uh, a dedicated team that is trained on your protocols. And if it's a program and there is a story behind it, like a compound, if it's an umbrella, uh, you know, kind of study or a compound related, um, we are ready with a clinical team to learn everything that we can about it and educate the patients about it throughout the journey. So on top of the digital communication, as soon as a patient gets matched to a sponsor trial, we do have... Uh, uh, a full team of, of people that uh, speak with these patients. The communication plan is um, uh, mostly digi di digitalized um, for the predictive patient journey, um, where we do have uh, a lot of uh, touch points and interfaces as soon as the patient is interested to learn more about a specific trial in the program. Did I answer? Do you have anything yes. to add? No, no. That was good. That was good. Um, another question from the audience. Do you plan on including other therapeutic areas other than cancer? Is that a question? Uh, right now we're in cancer. Of course we do in the future, but uh, I don't think it's coming in 2024. 
but probably later on, because we apply the same idea, the idea that the patient is in the center. This is the future. This is how we perceive uh, um, we perceive the, the this company and our vision. Uh, and uh, then we we just build a program the same way we do for any disease. Yeah, well, I'll add to that. So as you can imagine, a lot of our current uh, customers are, are are constantly requesting and asking if we can expedite, you know, the the development of uh, support for rare disease and beyond. So nothing in the in the real short term, but definitely on the roadmap, as Abitel mentioned. Another question. <laughs> Um, Anthony, do you follow patients through different phases of the study and the trial? The answer yes. is yes. <laughs> we do keep in touch with our patients. So every patient that is in the community and we've been communicating with, we are actually following up with and they become a member. I like to say that unfortunately cancer patients uh, are frequent frequent flyers, and as soon as they join wine trial, we see them again and again, and they continue on to join in clinical trials and clinical research, which is amazing. Uh, and we do follow up with them; they trust us. We build a very very strong trust relationship between our patient engagement and patient support teams, and these patients. And uh, you know, uh, we like to nurture this. And we think that this is extremely important to us because what we want and what we are creating at Lille is a situation in which a patient leaves the doctor's office with the results of their scan and they go and the, they tell their families and then they tell us. And as soon as they tell us, we find and we fine tune and we match them to the right treatment choices and the right treatment options for them at that specific moment. And they realize that and they uh, keep on coming again and again. So we have that very strong long-term relationship with our patients in the community. And I would tell that specific relationship is what enables us to be able to provide the predictive patient journey, right? So that's, that's what it's all based on. And then uh, additional, uh, yeah, I'll just, I, I would just leave that with, with that. Uh, another one last question that we're taking now, because I think that we are running out of time. Uh, how do you see the program increasing diversity of real world representation? Yeah. So we see this tremendously. So a, a big, one of the biggest value adds that we provide to sponsors and a big reason that they, that they come uh, reach out to us is to ensure real world representation uh, and to help with their diversity, equity, inclusion numbers and, and planning. Um, they basically come to us in, in two, from two lenses. First, they want to gain access and exposure to our highly diverse community uh, makeup. But in addition, you're able to actually leverage the AI to identify and eliminate unconscious biases embedded into trial design or operational setup. Um, so, we help with sponsors when they're submitting for their diversity planning for with the FDA um, site selection. So we can actually target, you know, uh, minority patients where they're uh, located, their travel preferences, and then make recommendations from a site perspective that way. So it is a it's if you think about the mission of our company is democratize access to advanced cancer treatments for all. So it's an, ensuring real world representation isn't a goal of ours. It's, it's the fabric of, of who we are as a company. Exactly. <laughs> Nothing to add to that, Anthony. <laughs> okay. I think that was the last question. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Have a good one. Bye.